Welcome to Passion. For more information about Passion, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. This morning, uh, it's good to see you uh, here this morning, and we are uh, so delighted that you're here. Uh, it's a busy time. We've got uh, dozens and dozens of folks on the road. All of our, most of our college students are headed home, and we just wish them a Merry Christmas. We know some of them are watching over the Internet, and we just uh, are praying great days on them, and we are just delighted that you're here to help us celebrate. It's almost Christmas, y'all. Yeah, yeah, see, I knew it. I knew it. Only three of you are ready. Uh, I've, I've been listening to Christmas carols for like three weeks. Uh, like, Grandma all got run over by a reindeer, and... I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus and Jingle Bells and uh, all I want for Christmas is a hippopotamus and just everything I can do to try to get into the Christmas season, I'm still struggling. It just seems too early, doesn't it? I, not to mention it's 62 degrees outside, so it's kind of... How many of you done with your Christmas shopping? Raise your hand. Yeah, all right. I'll see the rest of you on Christmas Eve at the mall. Uh, you procrastinators, I know how you are. That's how we are, and that's just part of it, but... Uh, we want you to have a merry, merry, merry Christmas. We just believe in this is going to be a great time for you and your family as we celebrate the greatest gift that God has ever given us, His Son. And we want to make sure we keep focused on that. Amen? Amen. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, yeah. <clears throat> Good deal. Well, we started a series last week uh, about uh, detours. Uh, detours, comes, they come in all forms and shapes and sizes. I mean, they can be caused by interruptions. Uh, a detour could be caused by a cancellation. It could be caused by a meeting that's moved. It could be a delay. It could be a different route. Uh, there are other forms of detours as well. Uh, sickness is a form of a detour. Uh, I don't like it, but it is one. Lack, brokenness. All of these are, all, all these different things things have one thing in common and that one thing is that they are all detours they knock us off our intended route our preferred route the path that we ch would have chosen changes and these detours force us to go a different direction they force us to adjust they force us to choose a different way and just in case you've forgotten just just I know a week has passed and you've probably forgotten a, a, a truth that I need to tell tell you is and that is this I I hate detours. Uh, I, I'll leave those detours up to all of you adventuresome folks that have no schedule, have no calendar, have no uh, time consciousness. You can just float through life and it never bother you that you have to go a different route. I despise detours. Don't like them. Don't enjoy them. Don't embrace them very well. Anybody with me? Okay, three of us. All right, the rest of you just, just don't care. I, I don't get as bad as I hate detours, what I've discovered is that detours are a reality in life. As we, in 2012, and we sprint into 2013, I know most of you, if not all of you, maybe not all of you, because some of you just don't do this, but most of us plan our next year out. I, I've got the calendars to prove it. I can tell you what I'm doing every month. I, I've got it all mapped out. I've got it planned. I've got a path selected. But what I've discovered is that even as much as we plan all that, the reality is, is that it doesn't always turn out that way. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we begin to walk forward and things change. So last week we started this, we, we, we jumped off from the story of Abraham. And, and in case you weren't here or in case you've forgotten, you'll remember the story. Abraham is selected by God to go to a promised land. He begins marching towards the promised land. God gives him a, the, the greatest gift of his life, which is a son, an heir, uh, his, his legacy, his, the, the pride of his life, the apple of his eye. It's his son. And then you know the detour takes place. God asks him to sacrifice his own son. It could be my most favorite message all year because I got to use my own son as an illustration and hold a sharp knife above his head. I, I don't know. I might have to repeat that about every six months just to remind him who's in charge. But, but the, 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 this detour comes and Abraham is asked to, to sacrifice his son. And out of that account, we learn some lessons. See, you've got you to make some decisions before you get to the detour. 
There are some decisions, some detour decisions that you have to wrestle through before you arrive at the detour. Or when you get there, you'll make the wrong choice. You, you'll remember the decisions that I asked you and challenged you with. The first was this, is uh, what will you do when your expected end is not his intended end? What are you going to do when everything doesn't turn out like you expected it to? Will you continue to obey? Will you continue to serve? Will you continue to follow when you've laid all your plans out and something dislodges you from those plans and causes you to go a different direction? Will you continue to follow when you're in your expected end doesn't look like his intended end? It's a tough decision. You need to make that decision right now or when the the, the, the divergence from path occurs, what will happen is if you haven't struggled and wrestled through that decision right now, when that change comes, you'll make the wrong choice. Are y'all awake this morning? I just want to make sure. We're just doing a little review here. Uh, uh, the, the second decision is this. Uh, what are you going to do? What will be the choice that you make when the answer you want to receive is yes, but God says no? That's a decision that you must wrestle through and that you must deal with right now because we all like yes. I, I want God to always say yes. God, can I buy the car? Yes. Can I buy that house? Yes. Can I marry her? Yes. I, can, can I beat my kids? Yes. Can I? No, uh, you don't ever say. Uh, can, can, I, can I kick the dog? Yeah. But how many of you know there are moments in your life when God says no? And if we're not careful and we don't wrestle through this decision when God says no, we will push past his no to try to force him to say yes, and we end up devastated. How many of you have ever disobeyed a no, and it come back to bite you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bought the car, you bought the house, you bought the dog, you bought the lie, and it puts you in pain. you got to know what you're going to do right now when God says no deter decisions and so today what I want us to do is I want us to go forward and I want us to continue continue to become equipped to handle deters by dealing with deter details and so if you want to I want you to join me in Judges chapter 6 now I'm not going to read the whole story to you. I'm just going to read the first 16 verses because the truth is you already know the story. There's a Paul Harvey element to this. You know the rest of the story. You learned it in children's church. You learned it in Sunday school. You learned it on your mama's knee. I don't know. You know the, you know the outcome of the story. But we need to back up and learn the details that start this story. It's in Judges. It's about Gideon. You know Gideon. You know the story. But, but let's see what God says. In Judges chapter 6 beginning in verse 1, it says this. Yet again, the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under domination of Midian for seven years. Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves hideouts in the mountains, caves, and forts. And when Israel planted its crops, Midian and Amalek, the Easterners, would invade them and camp in their fields and destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They left nothing for them to live on. I just I think that's a perfect example even to this day of what the enemy does. The, the job description of the enemy has not changed. He's still here to kill and steal and destroy. He leaves you absolutely nothing to live on. That is his plan. That is his intent. He hates you. I could preach from right here. He wants to leave you nothing to live on. That's what the enemy does. That's a detour. I'll have to come back to that. They, they, they left nothing for them to live on, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. They, uh, bringing their cattle and tents, they came in and took over like an invasion of locusts, and their camels were past counting. They marched in and devastated the country. The people of Israel, reduced to grinding poverty by Midian, cried out to God. For help, I, I just need to remind some of you that haven't been with us very long. About a year ago, I preached a message series called Help, and, and I just made this statement, and I need to remind you that, that you reflect on this. The one answer to prayer that God will always respond to is help. When we get past that moment where we think we can fix it on our own and we get past that moment that we quit asking mama for help and grandmama for help and, and brother for help and sister for help and we come to that place in our own life where we're so desperate that the only thing we know to do is look up at God and say, God, help me. It is that prayer that God always responds to. He responds. They cried out for help. 
One time when the people of Israel had cried out to God because of Midian, God sent them a prophet with this message. God, the God of Israel, says, I delivered you from Egypt. I freed you from a life of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's brutality and then from every oppressor. I pushed them out of your way and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am God, your God. Don't for a minute be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but you didn't listen to me. I could stop right there, but that would be a detour. Verse 11. One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak and Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abzerite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press out of sight of the Midianites. And the angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. And Gideon replied, with me, my master? If God is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Today's a good day. There are a bunch of people asking that question this morning. All over this country, people are saying, if you're with us, God, if you're Emmanuel, then why have you allowed all this to happen? And he goes on and he says, where are all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about telling us didn't God deliver us from Egypt the fact is God you have nothing to do with us he you have turned us over to Midian it's a pretty interesting conversation and I love this phrase maybe this phrase ought to speak into your spirit listen to God's response I love this but God faced him directly and I, I just stop here and chase a little rabbit and say maybe some of you need to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Maybe God needs to face you directly. Uh, get your attitude right. Get your response right. Get your perspective right. Let him face you directly. And then God says this, go in this strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I just sent you? And Gideon said to him, me, my master? How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the runt of the litter. And God said to him, I will be with you. Let me just stop right now and just say that that is the promise that we still have. That is why we can face the challenges of life. That's what can get you through in the, in the worst moment of your life is there is a promise right there that you need to take for your own. God is with us. That's why we can face what we face. He goes on and he says, Believe me, you'll defeat Midian as one man. The, the, this is the, the backdrop. The, the children of Israel... The Bible says have done evil again. It was the cycle that they lived in. They, they were once again in bondage and, and they were living in fear. In fact, the Bible says that they were so afraid that, that they would go and they were running for the hills. They were finding caves and holes in the walls and depressions in the side of the mountain to try to get away from the enemy. They were in fear for their life. They were in complete and total despair and bondage. It was not a good day. They cry out for help from God, and we pick up the account here where God hears their, their, their cry and their demand for help, and he answers by having this encounter, this dialogue, this conversation with a young man by the name of Gideon. And, and Gideon, you find him in an interesting situation. Gideon, the Bible says, is hiding. He's trying to keep out of sight. He's in an inconspicuous place trying to just get by. He's trying to get enough harvest together that the enemy won't see it, that he can just feed his family, just minding his own business, just making it through the day. And at that moment, a designed detour overtakes him. And in the process of this encounter, we are given detour details that we need to know as we march forward and more than likely will face a divergence of path. We've got to know the details to make it through. A uh, couple, three, I, I just got three quick ones. I just want to share them with you quickly this morning. I, I just need to give you some details. I, I just want to say to you this morning that this account teaches us this truth. You cannot hide from detours. You just can't. 
Uh, Gideon is is minding his own business and he's overtaken by a teacher. Moses is residing in a palace and he's overtaken by a teacher. Joseph is simply sharing his dream and he's overtaken by a teacher. David is alone on the backside of the desert having church all by himself and out of nowhere a teacher overtakes him. You just need to know today that regardless of your station, regardless of your position, whether you're living in the middle of a palace moment or whether you're living in the middle of a desert moment. The truth is, is that you cannot hide from a detour. A detour will find you. You cannot get away from it. See, some of you are trying to fly under the radar. Y'all just thought this was going to be a nice little sweet little message. I got some hard questions and some hard statements to make to you today because, see, some of you just trying to fly under the radar. You're You're just minding your own business. You just, you aren't attempting anything radical. You're not taking any risks. You're not taking any chances. You're not trying anything that unless God intervenes, it will fail. You are just trying to scrape by, trying not to bother nobody, just get enough for you and your family to get by. You're trying to avoid pain. You're trying to avoid uh, distress. You're trying to avoid all of that. And some of you literally think that if you can do nothing, that you will avoid detours. And what I came to tell you this morning is this. You cannot hide from a detour. Listen to me. Let me give you the details. Like Gideon, you may only want to take care of your own business, but God will use a detour to get you into his business. You can't hide. See, I've watched some of you over the last 10, 11 months and I, I've seen some of you check out. I, I, I see that you've you've moved yourself to the sidelines. You've shelved yourself. You 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 say I, I, I'm just going to zone out. I'm going to quit. I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to refuse to get involved. I'm going to fail to engage. I'm just going to go through the motions. If I could just come on Sunday and sit here, no, I ain't going to bother nobody. I'm just going to have myself a little church, and then I'm going to run home, and then I'm not going to bother nobody all week, and I'll come back and I worship a little bit more, and I'll go home, and then I'll come, and I just want to avoid any all of that, and I and God won't be able to find me, and I and I just sit here and mind my own business. Can I just tell you this morning? God won't leave you alone. God will not allow you to hide like that. If you are hiding, what you will discover is that you are more likely to face a detour because God will send you a detour to try to get you to pray again. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. See, I, I've just discovered something. We don't pray as much when everything's going well. When my car starts when it's supposed to, I don't pray nearly as much. When, when, when I look at my bank account and there's actually something in there, I don't pray like I probably should. When my kids are acting right and they're making good grades and I didn't even ask them to do the homework and they come home and they start doing the homework, I don't pray as much as I normally do. When I'm not sick like I thought I would be sick, then I, I just start. Yeah, maybe it's just me. I know y'all so holy. Y'all pray 24 hours a day, 360. But but, but I just am convinced of this. God will allow teachers to come into your life to move you again, to get you to pray again, to get you to serve again, to get you to obey again, to get you to believe again, to make some movement. God will send teachers in your life just to get you back in the game. You can't hide. Ready or not, here he comes. And if you are hiding right now, you better get ready because a detour will be designed for you. The the, the second detail I need to tell you this morning is this truth that that this account reveals to us, and that is this. Detours expose your insecurities. I I want you to notice, if you will, that uh, in this detour that in Gideon's life, it brings to the surface and to the forefront Gideon's own insecurities. God interrupts him in order to send him down a new path, to send him as a deliverer, to send him as someone that's going to set a nation free. And instantly Gideon has to struggle with and fight with and bring, it brings to the surface his own insecurities. I want you to see what he says. He goes, uh, God, I thought I heard you say you want to use me. I, and you want me? Are you nuts? God, God don't you know... That, that my story is this. I am from the weakest tribe of the entire nation. You, that, you don't want me. 
And not only that, not only am I the weakest from the weakest tribe, I, I'm the runt of the litter. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I can't do it. Gideon begins to make excuses based on his own insecurities. It would appear to me, the detail that I've learned from this account, is that it appears to me that God has this tendency to send detours into our lives to expose our insecurities. I'm just trying to help you make it through the detour, y'all. I, I, I just see it that way because isn't it, isn't it true that when you wake, wake up right in the middle of the detour that your insecurities are exposed? I mean, when you're expected to be healed and you're sick, doesn't it reveal your insecurities and your trust issues? When you expected to always succeed and now failure comes into your life and it's a detour, doesn't that cause you to begin to question some things? I know y'all are more righteous than that and you glow and all that good stuff, but, but I just want to need to tell you my story. When, when, when a detour comes into my life, it reveals the insecurities and I begin to question who I am and what my abilities are and can I... All right, y'all don't have to be honest. Y'all just keep smoking whatever you're smoking and living in your little la-la land and believe that it ain't. Hey, I'm going to tell you when a detour comes along, it'll make you question some things. When you expected to be always together and now you're not. Okay, some of you are finally messing up. Uh, uh, don't you feel powerless in the middle of a detour? Isn't it true that a detour makes you feel uncertain and I feel unable and I feel forsaken and I feel helpless? But the detour details are this. God uses detours to expose our insecurities, not so that we will be embarrassed. He wasn't trying to embarrass Gideon. No, God sends detours not to embarrass us, but to force us to come to grips with greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Uh, here, here was the problem. Didn't I say I sent you? Didn't I say I would be with you? Here, here's what detours do. Here are the details. Detours help us recalibrate to God's ability to operate in and through us. That's why when a detour is sent your way, insecurities rise to the surface because God is trying to get you to see past you. That's all right. It, it, it's a reminder that God is bigger than our insecurities and that he can use us not because of our strength, but that God can use us in spite of our weaknesses. See, I, I'm convinced of this. If it wasn't for teachers, we would fall into one, one of two categories. A group of us would think we're too strong. I can do this without you, God. Man, you don't even know how gifted I am, God. You don't even understand how blessed I am. God, you, I got gifts you don't even know about. I don't need. If it wasn't for a teacher, you, think, you would think you could do it in your own ability and power. And then there are some of you sitting here that if you were left to your own devices, you would think you were too weak. And God will bring a detour along to expose your insecurities so that when you begin to make excuses, he can interrupt you in the midst of your excuses and say, I didn't ask you about your ability. I'm basing what I've asked you to do not on your ability, on my ability. The, 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 the details of a detour are this, that God will send them your way to get your focus off of you long enough that you can focus on him. That's what a teacher forces you to do. He's not trying to embarrass you by exposing your issues. He's trying to erase your issues by getting you to focus back on his ability. See, I, I don't know what your insecurities are today. I know some of them because I know some of them better. But, but, but I, I, I know this. God knows your insecurities. He, he doesn't want you to overlook them or cover up or forget them. He uses the uncertainty and the unknown that you're going through right now to bring all of those insecurities to the, to the surface so that you can address them and overcome them with his help. That is what a teacher forces you to do, is it forces you to begin to question your own ability so you'll quit depending on it and focus on his ability and rest in that. Are you with me this morning? There's a third detail I need to tell you. And it's important. Probably the most important lesson I can teach you this morning about detours is this, is that detours often look like a mistake 
long before they ever begin to look like a miracle. Let that sink in. I just came to tell somebody that your detour will look like a mistake long before it ever begins to look like a miracle. Isn't that true with Gideon? I mean, you think about it, certainly God, surely made, you made a mistake. I mean, come on, man, you, you're selecting Gideon? Come on, man, you, you're going to use Gideon? This has got to be a serious mistake, God. He's from the weakest tribe. He's a, he's a weakling. He says it himself, I, I'm the weakest member of my family. I, I, I know some of y'all aren't old enough to remember this, but y'all remember the little bazooka gum that used to have the little cartoon strips in it? The, the, the advertisement was in them, and then also on the back of comic books, it was about the 98-pound weakling. Y'all remember that little cartoon? It was a Charles Atlas uh, advertisement, and he had this system where you didn't use weight, you used your own uh, resistance. To, I, I know this because... I was the 89-pound weakling. I weighed 89 pounds in ninth grade. wrestled there, and I was just a madman. I was strong. No, I wasn't. I was a wimp. Uh, see, I got this picture in my mind. I've always had this picture in my mind of Gideon that he was this bodybuilder, strong superhero, but I don't think so anymore. I think he was the 98-pound weakling because he looked at himself and he said, I'm the weakest member of my family. I don't have a hope of bringing deliverance. I don't have, I think he sent in for the Charles Atlas program. I think he was trying, he was in the back hiding somewhere trying to get strong. He was a wimp. This has got to be a mistake, God. No, you don't choose Gideon to bring deliverance. I mean, you think about Gideon. He's, he's from the weakest tribe. He's a wimp. He's unproven in battle. He's never won a victory in anything. He's probably the last person picked for his dodgeball team at school. He has no following. He, he, he isn't a military genius. He's not a military strategist that can set and move pieces and figure out how to win impressive victories with smaller force than the other. No, none of that. He, he, he has, he's unarmed. I mean, I'd pick the guy with, like, the swords and stuff. He's got nothing to fight with. He, he, he has no resources. This has to be a mistake. You think about all the accounts in Scripture where people were sent on a detour, and it always looks like a mistake first. Think about it. You're going to choose Abraham? I mean, come on, bro. He's like old. Like he's really old. And you're going to make him the father of nations? Come on, man. He's just too old. You're going to use Moses? Pick Moses? That's got to be a mistake. I mean, he's a, he, can, he can't even he can't talk, talk right. He, he, stu, 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 he, he can't get his words out. Gonna use David? Come on, man. The Bible said you're gonna send him to fight Goliath. God, come on, really? You that's a mistake. The Bible said he was a ruddy faced teenager. He probably had zits. You're gonna send him out to fight a Goliath, a giant, be the deliverer of a nation? Come on, God, that's gotta be a mistake. Gonna use Rahab? Yeah. Prostitute, hooker, a few other words. That's who you want to use? This has got to be a mistake. Job? You want to use Job? I mean, come on, man. He, he's, been, he's been marked by tragedy, and there's so much sorrow in his life. That's got to be a mistake, God. Well, we'll go into the New Testament and see if there's any mistakes in there. You want to use Matthew as a disciple? You do recognize that Matthew was a tax collector. He worked for the IRS. You want him to be the guy that tells other people about Jesus, and he's going to, nobody's going to listen. In fact, nobody's going to believe him. Nobody's going to invite him to their house because they don't want him to, want him to see what he's got, what they've got. They, they, no, God, this has got to be, you want to use Peter? Really? This is a mistake. Peter, like, has a really bad temper, short fuse. He blows up at the drop of that. You can't use Peter. That's got to be a mistake. Paul? Paul, the murderer Paul, the one that's actually killing Christians Paul. Nah, you can't. That's Dieter details. Dieters always look like mistakes long before you recognize that there's a miracle involved. That's true in the natural. Uh, it always happens. Silly putty. 
Y'all know Silly Putty was a mistake? The guy was trying to find a substitute, a new rubber product to build tires for military vehicles during the wars. And he recognized that there was a lot of silicone available, so he, he mixed it, I think it was with borax acid or something like that. And, and all of a sudden, this new compound was formed, and they couldn't get it to form tires. In fact, they couldn't get it to do anything but bounce. Looks like a mistake. Millions of dollars later. Post-it notes. Y'all know that was a mistake? The guy that, that did that was trying to make the world's strongest adhesive. And what he discovered is when he finished, it was one of the weakest. And what happened was a lady that worked in his office was at church and needed to mark her place in her hymnal, and she realized that she could smear some of that weak adhesive on a piece of paper and stick it there to mark her place and remove it and not destroy the page it was attached to. And lo and behold, a detour that looked like a mistake becomes a million-dollar miracle. Penicillin. You do know that they dug penicillin out of the trash, right? He threw it away because it wasn't doing what he thought it would do, and all of a sudden, miracle drug. Pacemaker, microwave, x-ray machines. What are we learning? We're learning that some things look like a mistake long before they ever look like miracles. Well, what does that matter to me? Well, the divorce you went through, the bankruptcy that you endured the broken heart that you've endured the death that tragically came into your life those things can look like mistakes long before you ever get the revelation that somehow some way out of that God is producing a miracle we 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 don't we don't think about it like that and therefore what happens is this is that more times than not a detour that we are facing or that we will face if, caused by God or caused by somebody else's choices many times they will look like the biggest mistake of our life And then on the back end, when perspective comes, we realize they were actually a moment for a miracle. See, the fact is, is that Gideon reveals that when you face a detour, you're going to feel like God has completely forgotten you. Some of you there now, you think God has, you, God, you don't even know where I am, buddy. You, you, you used to look out for me, and I can't, you don't even have a clue where, you don't even know where I go to church. You don't know where I work. You don't know where I eat. You don't know what I'm going through. You've forgotten me completely and totally. That's how some of you feel this morning. And I just came to encourage you this morning that the detour you're facing looks like a mistake. But if you'll just hold on, and you'll keep obeying, and you'll keep marching, and you'll keep walking, and you'll keep serving, and you just keep plugging on. There will come a moment somewhere on the horizon of your life. I can't tell you when. It may be longer than you anticipated. I can't tell you when. But if you would just hold on, the day will come when you will understand that that detour became a miracle. In fact, the reason it is important for you to learn that is this, is if you don't recognize that truth, then you'll try to fight your way out of your detour. In fact, I, I've preached to you already. Why don't you preach to one another? Why don't you nudge your neighbor right now and say, don't detour detours. Come on, tell them. Don't you dare. Here's my challenge to you this morning is that some of you are missing miraculous moments because they are wrapped up in the disguise of a detour. If you are unwilling to change paths, if you are unwilling to accept his plan, if you are unwilling to adjust to his way, and then you will miss the break-ins and the breakthroughs that are only established in your life by walking down a detour. Without a detour, the children of God, the children of Israel would have remained in bondage. And I just came to tell somebody listening to me, I don't know who this is for, I just came to tell you that without a, the detour you're in right now, if you aren't willing to walk through it, you will remain in bondage. Just trying to help you. Why aren't you seeing any miracles? Could it be that you're walking out your plan instead of his? Could it be the detour he designed for you was aborted or passed up because you thought it was a big mistake? 
I have some questions for you. Are his ways still higher than our ways? Are his thoughts still higher than our thoughts? And if the answer is yes, then don't you think we ought to walk the path that he's designed for us? Here's the detail you need to know. Feeling forgotten and feeling forsaken may actually be a corridor of favor. See, I need you to understand, and I'm going to get out of your way. I just need to tell you this is the way it is. Job proves this. Others prove it to us, and that is this, is that when you're about to go down a detour, people will, even God-fearing people will walk into your life and point at about what you're getting ready to go through and say, that's a mistake. And you have to be mature enough and know God's voice well enough to ignore the people that are telling you it's a mistake. They will look at you and say that sickness that you're going through has to be a mistake. God's forgotten you. God's forsaken you. Why don't you just sit down and be quiet and refuse to praise? That's got to be a mistake. That pain that you're going through, that brokenness that you're going through, that's a mistake. God has forgotten you and he's, he's forgotten all about you. He's forsaken you. Why don't you quit serving? Why don't you quit obeying? It's a mistake. It's got to be a mistake. And what I need to teach you to do this morning is this, is you got to look back at them and say, hey, just watch me. While you're over there calling this a mistake, I'm just going to keep following God. And I don't know what day it's going to happen. It may be a week from now. It may be six weeks from now. It may be six months from now. It may not even be next year. It might be five years from now. But the day is coming that when I get to the end, what you thought was a mistake and you declared was a mistake, God positioned me in my life to walk through this so that on this end, I can walk into the greatest miracle moment of my life. And I refuse to allow what you think is a mistake to keep me from my miracle that ain't fun and that ain't easy but it's truth and I encourage you this morning you've got to recognize that when you begin this path it will almost always look like a major league mistake did I hear you wrong God did, what, did I read it wrong did I get the wrong information no you were just called to walk a path that looks like a mistake, but just hang on. The miracle is coming. Your day is coming. Your, your rescue is coming. But you've got to be willing to walk down that path to get there. I wrote this down, then I'll quit. Miracles come into our life when we're willing to walk through a doorway that God leads you through that will start out looking like a mistake. You and others may categorize the way you are walking now as a mistake. Listen, but it is not a mistake if it takes you where God wants you. And I don't know what you're facing this morning or what you will face. But if what you face gets you where God wants you, it's not a mistake. It was a designed detour. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you stand with me? Trying to get me in the mood. Let's get some Christmas going. You cannot hide. I'm trying to help you this morning. You cannot hide. In fact, if you're hiding right now, warning. Warning. If you're hiding, you can expect a detour soon. And I don't know what your insecurities are this morning, but I know this God will use a detour to get you focused off of you back onto Him. Because it's not by our power, our strength, it's His strength that we rely on. And I don't know what path looks like a mistake to you, and I don't know the pain you're enduring right now. And there are days you wake up and you think you've made the biggest mistake of your life that you'll never recover I just want to encourage you this morning be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and know that if you're walking according to his plan a miracle is on its way Father this morning I pray over my folks I thank you that you got us I, I thank you this morning Father that you know what's best for us Father, there's some folks under the sound of my voice. I, I know their story well enough to know that some of them are, 
have checked out. They've zoned out. They've quit. They've sidelined themselves. They've served, and now they're not serving. They've worshipped, and now they're not worshipping. They've obeyed, and now they're just kind of trying to get up under the radar so nobody will see them, and just trying to scrape by and get by with just enough. God, I pray that they would come out of hiding today. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus right now that you would allow them to recognize that they cannot hide from you. You're relentless in your pursuit of us. Father, I don't know everybody here and I don't even know everybody's insecurities because we're taught to hide them so well. But Father, if if you're messing with folks and and causing them to feel uncertain and insecurities are apparent to them and they feel like the weakest, the runt, they feel like they have no ability, no resource, no power, then Father, I pray this morning we would learn this truth that you are trying to get us to get our attention off of us and you allow those insecurities to come to the forefront so that we won't depend on us. We will begin to depend on you and we will learn to put our trust in you. We will quit trusting us. So I pray for anybody this morning that's really feeling less than. I pray that they would meet the more than today. I pray that they would meet the mightier than today. I pray that they would meet this one that has more strength, more power, more ability, more authority, more provision, more healing than they've ever experienced in their life. Help us to get our attention back on you. Finally, Father, I pray for those that are struggling because they feel like they're walking through a mistake. God, I know there are folks in in this room right now that didn't even choose the path that they're on. Other people made decisions that have deterred them. And they feel like it's a mistake. And it's brought brokenness. It's brought lack. It's brought pain. But this morning, I pray that they would recognize that what others may see as a mistake, your word declares that before we were ever born, your only desire for us was to prosper us and that you never intend to do us harm. So if if we're walking down this path, even though it may seem like a huge mistake, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus right now we would rest in this fact we can continue to walk and when we walk in obedience and we walk in your way even when we don't understand it and even when it's not enjoyable and even when we don't like it then we can rest in this fact a miracle is coming and God I pray that when others step up and begin to declare over our life you made a mistake you made a mistake you've messed up it's the wrong choice it's the wrong way God I pray that something would rise up in us and we would take courage and we would continue to walk the way that you've called us because we don't want to deter the deter if the deter is going to get us where you want us to be so I pray that you give us strength every head bowed every eye closed nobody looking around except my prayer team if you're here this morning you say Steve I recognize today that I need Jesus. I don't know him as my Savior. I need to take a detour right now. I need to get back on the right path. And I need to accept Christ as my Savior today. Give him my heart and life. If that's you, we will not embarrass you. This is not about embarrassing you. This is about getting your focus back on him. And if that's you, would you just quickly raise your hand and pull it right back down so we can pray intelligently for you. Is there one that needs to give their heart to Jesus today? This is your day. He's designed this whole detour, getting you here today. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.